I'll take the honours of introducing our final session for today, which is our keynote artist talk by Olaf Nikolai, chaired today by Dr. Luke Skrabowski. Um, Luke teaches the history and theory of late modern and contemporary art at the University of Manchester. He's the co-author with John Jacob of Trevor Paglen, Sights Unseen, published by the Smithsonian in 2018, and the co-editor of Aesthetics and Contemporary Art, published by Sternberg in 2011. He's published in many journals and talked all around the world about a whole host of issues, ranging from conceptual art and its histories to systems art and the legacies of both. So I'm going to hand over to Luke. Uh, Luke will be chairing this final session and we'll start by introducing Olaf. So Luke. Thanks, Nick. Great to be here. And um, I'm going to introduce Olaf and we'll get into his talk. So Olaf is a conceptual artist whose practice ranges from sculpture to music to publishing. By transferring ideas from the natural sciences and humanities into the realm of the aesthetic, his interdisciplinary projects reflect on the politics of form, of labor, circulation of culture, and urban history. Numerous solo exhibitions have been presented since the late 1990s, including a recent three-part survey at Kunsthalle Vienne, Kunstmuseum St. Gallen, and Taxis Palace Innsbruck and his pavilion for Germany at the 56th Venice Biennale in 2015. Nikolai has a background studying literature and philology and wrote his PhD on the Vienna Group, at the University of Leipzig. His awards as an artist include the Wilhelm Loth Preis in 2018, the Kunstpreis der Stadt Wolfsburg in 2002, and a major public memorial for victims of the Nazi military justice in Vienna in 2014. His work has been presented in group exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art and Moderna Museum Stockholm at Biennales, including Berlin, Busan, and Guangzhou, and as part of Manifesta and Documenta. So I'm just delighted to be able to introduce Olaf to you today and to hand over to him now. Uh, thank you very much, Luke, for the uh, kind introduction and hello to the audience. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, talk and series of talks. And I was also very happy to listen to the sessions before. And there were so many things what I hope uh, I can continue. A lot of threats which I felt very, um, yes, uh, touched by. I mean, especially when Jane uh, Partner was talking about the importance of interpunctions and then um, Charles Bernstein, especially his talk uh, about the question, what is poetry when he was introducing or when he was mentioning that Lawrence Wiener refused to participate in the exhibition because he has no common crown, maybe with poetry. It reminded me on an episode I had with a, with a journalist uh, uh, two, three months ago when he asked me what I'm interested in, especially in my work. I said, it's poetry. And then uh, she looked at me like, oh, poetry. And it was really like, oh, how can you think about such a thing? And I've immediately understood that she sees that there's a concept of poetry out there, especially in the visual arts, which is maybe very distinctive from that what I'm interested in. So um, I decided for this uh, keynote to show you first a uh, film and then going from there just to slowly develop what this concept of poetry, what I feel dedicated to and interested in, can be. I cannot really describe it very clearly, but I hope I give you an idea, which is also a starting point for a certain discussion or question in a nice Q&A. So I would like to ask the technicians if we could start the movie. It's called Rodarchus, and it is uh, 12 minutes around. And uh, yes, let's watch it together, and then I will continue with my talk.
Rodakis was born in Mesa Gross on the island of Egina around 1816. As a child, he only knew the small towns of the island and the city of Piraeus.
No indication of his sudden disappearance can be found in later records about the house. The property was still visited by interested persons, who assumed that the inhabitants were Radakis himself or members of his family. So, yeah, thank you uh, for the technical help. I hope it was uh, possible to see it well. Um, this movie was done in 2007 and first time presented in 2008. And the house, what you have seen there, is a house really existing on the island of Agena. And the figure of Rodakis is a historical figure which is known, but in fact, there's really not so much known about him. I got along this house when I was exhibiting in the beginning of 2005 in Athens, and I was very interested in uh, the work of Le Corbusier at the Carter of Athens. And some architects recommended me to see this house because it was for them, when they studied architecture, one of the most inspirational references for modernism, before modernism, and also when Le Corbusier and Siegfried Gideon were visiting Athens, they had seen the house and saw it as an example of how the principle of modernism or principles of architecture, which are natural, which are there, because it was also a period in the late 20s when they were very interested in to find a kind of key concept for modernism, which was not abstract, which was more based in the national traditions of buildings. Anyhow, so when I was studying uh, this house and I was reading about it, uh, there were very strange stories about the main character, Rodokus. So it appeared in all the stories what I uh, had read and all the documents I've seen that all the people who met him met the same guy. It doesn't matter if they have met him around 1910 or 1930 or if they have met him in the late uh, 1890s. So it seems that he didn't change age. So, and at the end, I had really no idea what to do. I was just wanted to do a movie that I was sure I was trying to document the house, but I had nothing what I really wanted to say in the sense there was no story. And then I understood when he is like a ghost, I have to treat him like a ghost. So I contacted the medium, went with her to the house, and she was reading the house. She was channeling the ghost and all the facts given in this uh, narration, which you hear as a voiceover for this movie, comes from this two taste uh, session with the medium. Why I show this uh, film now here, when we talk about poetry, uh, is the role and the concept of language, which uh, comes into play, and also how language, space, what we call sculpture, and the relation, what we have to images and space, are framed or based or in a very specific way um, formatted by that what we call language. I'm not really sure uh, if the term language covers correctly what I want to mention, but uh, I try to go from there. And the idea what this movie is presenting in a certain way is that 
the character of this concept of language, which helps us to perceive and also to produce things, can be used in a way what is creating this kind of fictional episodes, which are intermixing with the imaginary and the symbolistic uh, system, that reality is formatted in a different way. That is another um, work where I try to work that out, and which is referring to that. Uh, what you see all the time here, this little uh, reference, is not tr uh, only an image to introduce you to a kind of typical Berlin street. It is a location which became part of a work uh, without that people working in this location or somebody else really knew about that. Um, maybe we can show the next slide. It is a work which is called Le Boule de Voyant. Uh, it's this kind of little laborella what I have here in my hand, and you see the image. And the piece is called A Narration Performed in Ten Episodes. So what it is, this little laborella which shows on the front page a uh, little uh, typographic uh, insinuations of episodes which are La Boule de Voyant, and each of the episodes have a title. And also you see the typo is varying, the color is varying, everything is there, what you need to advertise an episode. When you see the backside of this um, little laparella, which we see in the next slide, all of them have also references with images. So you have a kind of idea what these episodes maybe can be or not. What you have as well is a calendar, where you can see where the episodes are happening. And you have also on the information given the spaces where they are happening. So the shop you have seen first is a place which was in September where uh, the, thing were the thing was happening. And you could go there in the period of time. And when, if you really would go to all the 10 places and you would have seen the 10 places and you would have seen what's going on in these 10 places, you would uh, see performances, uh, not sure knowing if these are performances which I would go anyhow, or if it is something what was made specially for you. I never taught anybody uh, if the people who were participating in this piece knew that they are participating in this piece, but they were participating. So that's exactly what I wanted to say with the word talkers thing. You participate also if you don't know that you participate. And that is what I call this concept of language, what I'm very interested in. Um, one of the main references for me, or the inspirations uh, for that, if we continue, one more, yes, uh, are poets from the group Ulipo, Harry Matthews and George Barak. Um, Ulipo is a group uh, which was founded in Paris, and they dedicated themselves to how, what they call potential literature. That is more or less creating uh, works. I would not say literature. They also produced a lot of books and a lot of um, publications. But they also uh, were very much uh, interested in how you transform intentions into actions, how you transform intentions into intensities. And one of these examples is this book, Russell and Venice. It's again the way how a space is on very different layers transformed through the concept of language. You see Russell in Venice, and it is about Ramon Russell and a visit to Venice he paid um, with his mother in the early 20th century. The interesting thing is that Harry Matthews and George Breck in this book, um, referring to letters written by Russell from Venice, and maybe next page, um, they also had this idea that the topography of Venice, what you see in the left image on the right side, Venice, you see Venice, it's a joke, is more or less the topography which is mirroring all the books written by Ramon Roussel. Of course, the letters which they discovered are not existing. Of course, every detail what was reported in terms of the facts with the life of Roussel are more or less something which was not very clear if this uh, can be proved or not. So a lot of scholars were really interested in these kind of sources, where they are coming from. And, but they never were uh, saying a word about it. So Russell and his invention of 
reality out of language, which immediately became also reality again, was a very big inspiration for the Ulikos. And so the date of the visit of Roman Rousseau was an inspiration for me to create a kind of new encounter in Venice again. So, and as a piece of an anniversary, uh, when Rousseau was visiting Venice, I proposed to have a biscuit soiree to honor the visit of Rousseau in Venice. So maybe the next thing. The biscuit soiree uh, was an evening where people could eat cake in the form of a star. And what you see here is a souvenir what Roman Rousseau kept after he visited Camille Flammarion, the uh, great astronomer. And Georges Bataille was saying that he had found this object on a flea market in the 40s. So from there, this object made his travel into museum collections. So, but it is really unclear if uh, Bataille had found that on the flea market or how it came into the uh, property of uh, Bataille. But what for me was the interesting point, the eating of the star. So what I initiated, next image, please. Uh, this is a poster. And then when we go to the next image, when you were attending uh, the, the, the biscuit story where I invited to, you got a little leaflet, which was this one, the Le Mangeur d'Etoile. And you see when it happens and where it happens and what time we did it. We did it in the period of the time of sunset. And folded this poster was inside this little thing. And when you opened up, this uh, little invitation card, please, you saw the idea of Bataille, what he was thinking, what makes him thinking about the star. What do you think when you eat a star? What does it mean eating a star? Where you not just uh, thinking that you, as he says, uh, just have a star who is so little as a cake. It is more that you're thinking about yourself, really being a different person. He is describing it uh, much better than I can do it with my words right now. When you read that, what he was saying, he must have the intention of growing larger to the point of vanishing in the blinding depths of the heavens. So instead of vanishing, people came together, and maybe the next image, in a palazzo in Venice. And there were the star. And so it was a very pleasant evening. And it was more an action of having joy, talk, and being together in memorizing this kind of event, what never happened, the being of Roman Roussel in Venice. This uh, kind of performative piece was repeated uh, 2018 in Palermo, where Roussel died because of extensive drug uh, consume. And then later in Metz in the in an exhibition, in the opening of the exhibition about the night. So the performative aspect of this, how you can deal with it, was a very important thing for me. And uh, especially Roman Roussel with his concept, how you can use the sound of language to create different kinds of meanings. If you want, we can talk about this a bit more later in the discussion because I found that also a concept which was very inspiring. So Marcel's idea is very much based on language, but as I say, it is very much re redesigning our concept of perception and the idea of what is going on where we are and what is there. So maybe the next piece, please. There you see a bit of the uh, thing. Now, coming with the next thing to a more um, direct language-based uh, concept or uh, idea what I had working is Nom de Guerre. It is a little book which I published as a poetry book. It's really poetry in the sense that you have poems in there. It's this kind of book. And when you open up the book, you will find poems in the tradition of concrete poetry. For example, that one. They're all these words which are just composed to poems. Uh, if you can continue one more. 
second more. Yes. So when you read these poems, uh, you have no clue where these words are coming from. So it is really like uh, I have the intention of creating poetry and just having a vocabulary made out of several sources to compose these uh, poems. In fact, at the end, when you go to the back of the book, you find the annotation. And in the annotation, you will, can read that all the vocabulary used for composing these poems are the uh, words which are collected by the collection of all the code names of military actions after World War II. So I did a substantial research to collect these code names of military actions. For example, cut holes and sink them is a code name for the action of the US military when they sink uh, ships and uh, weapons into the ocean, which they don't use anymore. Feuerzauber was the code name for the, uh, uh, the um, GSG-9 uh, intervention against the Red Army fractions when they uh, hijacked uh, airplane and they were in Mogadishu. So, this you can find in the book. And what I was very interested in how not only the metaphorical power of language is used in these ways of uh, camouflage military actions, but also how you can reuse this power, what the metaphor has, which is exactly the space when, in between we create this kind of fictional ideas, what all these words can be and can be as well. So the pieces are not only existing as poems, as we see in the next image. They are also sculptures in a sense that they are neons, but not normal neons like the neon light, like Catherine Evans uh, sculptures we had seen before. These are so-called black light neons. And you can see it here a bit that these black light neons have the effect if you wear something uh, white, then it is reflecting. Anything else is not reflecting that much. So it is also mocking you and it is creating an atmosphere which somehow resonates with this idea of the norm, the guerre, the war, the action, the military action, and the way how uh, is the secret uh, is presented in this kind of using code names. So the word pieces, the poems are one thing, and then you have these sculptures, which are uh, in another thing presented as well. So talking about concrete poetry, uh, maybe the next image. Uh, I wanted to show you also the piece, which is one of the images where, which is used to, for the uh, conference in total. Uh, which is a monument, the monument of this memorial monument for the soldiers or people who were killed by the military, I quote, injustice of the National Socialists, which not only mean people who left the military illegal, also everybody who was uh, sent to a military court because they were not uh, helping correctly or they were sabotaging military production or whatever. Uh, all these people um, are honored with this kind of monument. The monument uh, is located in Vienna, and it was the first monument in the Austrian Republic which was uh, erected for these people. There was nothing before done. And it was not a monument which was erected by the Republic of Austria, it was erected by the um, city of Vienna because the city council was taken over by the Korean parties and they initiated that. And it took them very, very long to get along with that. The place where this monument is, is the so-called Ballhausplatz. And what you see is this kind of X, the shape of an X in three uh, uh, pedestals where you can walk up, this is the next. And the shape is uh, coming from, if we get the, the next, and the next, from a poem, which is a poem by Ian Hamilton Finlay. And the poem by Ian Hamilton Finlay is a very, very classic example of concrete poetry, which reads in the bars all, and then where the crossing is, you see alone. I don't think that I need very much to explain why this text was very appropriated for me 
uh, to be that what this monument should be. Because what I chose are the two elements what these traditional monuments have. They have a pedestal, they have an inscription. Then on top of the pedestal, they have, of course, something what is the theme of the monument. This monument has nothing on top of it. So if you would go on top of this monument, maybe you can go back again and you, yeah, or this, you can watch the sky or you can rest. But if you would stand there, and it's good if you go back to images, please, again, you see these buildings surrounding this monument. These are the seat of the government of Austria. This is the seat of the president. So if you are up there on this pedestal, then you are in the center of the power. You are seeing the power where the decisions are made about all these things which have to do with that what this monument is uh, somehow dealing with. The reference of this uh, place is also, again, very much linked to language and poetry because it is the space where in one chapter of Robert Muses, The Man Without Qualities, uh, the main character is uh, resonating about what is going on in these buildings. And one of these buildings is also going on this so-called parallel action, which is the main topic of The Man Without Qualities, uh, a kind of committee which is meeting and thinking about how they could memorize and celebrate an anniversary of the Kaiser. And the nice phrase, because Muse gives to all his chapters certain uh, mottos, the motto of this chapter is, all paths to the spirit starts from the soul, but none leads back. So there you have a monument and you have a lot of connections, which are again, transforming this space to different possibilities to engage with it and also to be somehow part of different, let's call it realities. The Vienna reference with this monument, why I'm in Hamilton Finlay, somebody could ask. Uh, I'm Hamilton Finlay had a very strong relation to Vienna. He was very close friend to some important poets from the Viennese scene, Ernst Jandl, Frederick Meyerecker, also uh, the people from the Vienna crew. And I also wanted that the English as a language is used there and not just a German because not only German or Austrian or German-speaking people were victims of this whole uh, injustice. There were a lot of uh, people from all over Europe as well uh, sent to death or to prison in this kind of injustice. So I wanted to open it up and not to see it only in this single thing and also to see the openness and the interconnection, the international aspect of such a event was mostly just seen as a national event. The Viennese aspect, and uh, Luc was uh, in the introduction mentioned it, has a, somehow a reference also to my more scientific work because I wrote a, not a book, it is a, just my thesis about the Vienna group. And one of the poets in this uh, Vienna group, uh, Hartse Artmann, um, is one of the characters who put in the early 50s already a statement out, which is somehow something what I was reminding in the beginning when uh, I was invited by Nick to this uh, conference uh, about poetry. I thought, wow, this is something what I really wanted to connect with. So maybe we can um, go to the next image. If you would uh, be in 2018 in Vienna and you would have buy a bookstore, uh, you would have seen this little shop window with this little book. And in the book, uh, you could read um, in English and in German, the eight point proclamation of the poetical act. And this is this statement by Hartse Artmann, which he published in the early fifties. And it starts with this sentence. There's one statement which is irrefutable. Namely, that one can be a poet without having so much as written or spoken a single word. The precondition for this, however, is more or less strongly felt the desire to act poetically. The allergical gesture itself can be elevated to an act of excellent beauty, even to the level of a poem. The term beauty, however, has been granted 
a very wide scope in this context. So I thought that Altman's statement is a very good uh, rounding up such a presentation about poetry in a sense, what I'm interested in poetry and language. And I want to show you, uh, because it was part of this exhibition, what Luke was naming this, uh, what was held in St. Gallen, Vienna, and Bielefeld at the same time. Uh, maybe you can have the next image. This is a bookstore which is located in this old town of Vienna, which is very essential for the Vienna's avant-garde. So then I used this bookstore for this exhibition, designing the window displays a bit. But when you enter the bookstore, when you go in, and what you can see in the next image, I arranged just with the material of the bookstore and exhibition by rearranging things. So you could go with a little guide through there and find little objects which are more or less talking to each other as objects. So for example, in the next image, you can see him, Hartze Ottmann, reading. And behind there is a little etching from Fritz Kremer. And the same time when this photograph was taken by Hartze Ottmann, this uh, was an example of socialist realism, where two workers are reading. So all these kind of little dialogues were in this store there, and maybe the next one, where you also say Jennifer Lopez, and then you see all these kind of uh, collage books, which also gave you a kind of tour through the universe created in this kind of poetical sense. Coming back to Artman's statement that you can be a poet without having written anything. It's just about a poetical action. In one of the sentences, the poetical act, as he called it, has eight points. And the last point uh, is very much about that the whole thing, what you do, cannot be seen, cannot be heard. It's not language what you can really read. So one of the last uh, pieces before I open uh, up for discussion is uh, book which I published uh, last year, which is, of course, language-based, but what kind of language? This is a long poem composed out of signs which you use by texting when you not use emojis. But before emojis, you used also uh, signs to mark certain preferences, certain emotional settings. So uh, this book was published uh, with a small publisher in Paris. And when you go through the book, which there are some pages which you can see in the next images, it's like this kind of typographical uh, installation. Yes, maybe the next one. And maybe the next one. Yes, and with this image of a little theater play, I would like to finish the presentation. If you see the double dots in the middle as something where there is somebody speaking and somebody's answering, you see it as a kind of dialogue. Um, this is a dialogue which really, uh, I think, could be read. I hope you enjoy it by reading it. And I thank you for paying attention to this little talk. Thank you very much, uh, Olof. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, so the format now will be uh, opening to questions through the chat, which I'm going to mediate uh, back to Olaf. But while I give um, you a moment to uh, formulate your questions, which we look forward to receiving, I thought I would um, take chair's privilege, as it were, to, to pose a question uh, and a sort of reflection to you, Olaf, which I was very uh, taken by your eight point proclamation of the poetical act and this idea that um, one merely needed to act poetically and, and not, not necessarily to write a thing. And that brought me right back to the first work you sh showed, Rodakis, which for me uh, really summoned this uh, ancient Greek idea of poiesis as a kind of bringing forth of something which, which didn't exist before. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, the, 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 the film summoned this in a, in, a, in a really richly evocative manner because you had the sort of survey of, of a certain kind of modernist ruin uh, that was still uh, identifiably uh, modernist, which you then used the kind of spirit medium to you know, reconstruct uh, that which didn't exist before, the biography of the architect of that space, while we sort of saw the 
um, uh, kind of um, poetic uh, dissolution or entropic dissolution almost of the space in which he had uh, kind of created his subjectivity. So the kind of double crossing motion almost uh, going on there. So I wondered if, um, yes, perhaps uh, underlying uh, a number of your works, there might be an, an, an interest in this, in this idea of poiesis as a, a bringing forth of that which did not exist before. Um, I detected that at least in, in a number of projects, and I wondered um, what you, uh, how you might respond to that suggestion. Yes, I mean, it is exactly uh, this idea, what can exist, what was not there yet, but on the watch, can, what, what does it mean if we say it is, was not there before? What is the potential thing? And what is the actualization of a potential thing? So, which is really a philosophical term, but it is not only a philosophical term in terms of uh, browsing it through when you say praises and the idea of uh, praxis. What is, is also the, 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 the question uh, of what I call the fictional power of language. And uh, when you, one of the most interesting examples, and maybe I have to come back to Vienna again, when Wittgenstein was writing his Tractatus, Locus Philosophicus, where he believed he had clarified all the, 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 the problems with language and metaphors and these kind of things. He was writing that one when he was at war in World War I. And in the diaries, when you look up the diaries, he was all the time writing about what function has the word no, nothing. And the, the power of language can be not illustrated, but experienced very quickly with the introduction of the word no into sentences. Just introduce the, neck, the no into a sentence. Create the no in a sentence. And you can immediately open something up which was not there before. So to think about something what is not existing is a fascinating concept. I mean, how can you do that? How can you think about something what is not existing? Is it possible? I don't know. But you can think that it is possible. So, and that is something what uh, keeps me busy in a very interesting way. But it's not so much that I had this theoretical idea before and then I was executing works. It's more by doing works that you slowly, uh, and you reflect what you did, that I felt slowly that this is one of the most interesting things for me, this way how the thing is, nothing will take, take place, but the place. What is a quote by Malamés, um, a throw of the dice, and Duchamp was writing it by hand for his uh, uh, large class. So th this idea of nothing, a lot of the thing, you know, also producing nothing. And you walk through a city and you imagine that the whole thing, what you see there, can be seen in a totally different plot, like in a criminal uh, story or whatever. The whole thing transforms immediately. And it's possible to see it, that you think, oh, wow, it's different. And then it comes to the point where you don't know if you are still there or not. And that is also the interesting thing which in the movie appears, the idea of the doppelganger. Mm -hmm. you know, what is that? You know, the, the, this kind of frequently switching between different things and the possibility to do that. And it's a question what I have. Uh, can animals do this as well? Okay. It's really something what I'm really uh, interested in. To, would that be possible? You know, there's a very interesting uh, photograph, photography, photography taken by some scientists where a bird is in front of a mirror documented. And uh, it's a magpie. And the bird has a little, little kind of um, jewel in the mouth. And you see, yeah, what, what is it doing? So, of course, you cannot say what it is doing. But the interesting thing for me was with these images that the scientists wanted to see if the bird has effects of conscious. And the mm -hmm. only way of doing that was that they had the idea that the, the, to study what the, how the bird is reacting to an image. So the function of an image, you know, means if there is conscious, you perceive images. That was the concept. In yeah. the moment the bird had a reaction where they say, oh, there was a reaction to that what the bird has seen. They thought, okay, that could be conscious. 
So it's not so much that I say, oh, that's right, or it's not right, or it's correct or not correct. It's more that they have a theory of images needed to study conscious. And I found it a quite interesting point when people discuss the importance of aesthetic production. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, in a sense, uh, kind of uh, opens up the question of, yeah, the po poiesis and isthesis across species. You know, is there a cross-speciation of this capability or, or this possibility that you're drawing on? Um, we've got a few questions coming in now in the chat, so I shall um, mediate um, some of them into you, and I'm just going to quickly um, scan them to try and uh, bring them into uh, perhaps a, a relation with the conversation as it evolves. But um, one from Benjamin Jenner to start, he said, thanks for the excellent informative talk. The way you talk about the spatialization of language that envelops people and places and places them in a temporal embrace, be it through the figure of the house or through the advertisement pamphlets, is reminiscent, uh, Benjamin says, of the work of collective action, who use the delivery of invitations to implicate an audience in an event before the invitation says the event has started. So Benjamin would like, you know, could, could you say something about um, this kind of invitation to participate, how that works in relation to space in your work, how space is layered in the figure of the house and the monument, which creates different audiences across time from multiple positions, be it physical or ideological. So it's quite a, it's quite a dense question from Benjamin. We can un, unpack it a little bit, but through this notion of, of space, the invitation or the implication of an audience before the event has begun, which he's you know, drawing this parallel with the work of collective action. And yeah, in, inviting you to perhaps um, elaborate on that, but particularly perhaps this notion of a kind of layering of space and in Benjamin's question um, and how that might work, uh, I, I, I extrapolate in this implication. I mean, I could answer it very short. Uh, that would be an, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, 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 there are, if you, you are in a space, you are surrounded by invitations. It, it's the question which you are taking. <laughs> right, I like that. What is what is the what is the prompt? What is the cue? What is what is the invitation you accept in a certain sense? Like you are also, in that dynamic. You accept, and it's also which you are able to see, because also the ability to see an invitation tells you something about your position in space. You cannot see. The same invitation in different times. You see the invitation only in one time. If you see the same invitation to a different point, uh, point in time, you see another invitation. It looks only the same. So that is the interesting thing. We are surrounded by invitations. The question is which we are taking. And uh, the answer to when we are interested, we find out why we are taking it, then things getting a bit blurred because then we have to reflect that. And reflection is uh, mostly after. So the interesting thing is, and Benjamin had this idea, can there be something like a conscious of the before the action is happening? You know? And so this is, but this is a very theological concept that you then dive into. Mm -hmm. If you would think about invitations, you can understand before they are articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a promise. Yeah, I, I, I find that very interesting in relation, I guess, to uh, maybe the history of conceptual art, which is obviously referenced in your work, has come up through the invocation of Lawrence Wiener earlier. But in, in a way there, the assumption is that something can be pre-conceptualized and then actualized in a fairly straightforward movement. But I think what you're uh, elaborating here is that, you know, quite often that might be recursive or it might come the other way around or that, yeah. that maybe you're interested in those uh, moments or el elaborating them, thinking about them, producing them. Uh, it is also what happens with that, the concept of coincidences, you know? Well, when things happening and you cannot explain them, what is it? Or how can you create something which uh, really has no intention? So I don't know if this uh, is answering or maybe it's more confusing than answering. I, th I think it was a, I, I like the idea of a, a, a very short answer to a very long question. It, it, <laughs> I think it functioned very well and it opened out nicely. And 
address them. I mean, uh, we've got one coming in from Nick, uh, which perhaps maybe uh, I, th I think relates is possibly tangential, but he's asked after the, the question of, of design. So I think this speaks to the question of intention. He's, he's asked about design. In particular, he says typography to the sharing or exhibiting of the poetical act as art. So, you know, what in a certain sense is the, um, the function of, 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 the, of design, perhaps particularly typography, when we concretize the poetical act as art, I mean, I think that's you know very manifest in your uh, memorial work, but uh, you know across across your practice, and yeah, perhaps also speaks to this question of pre-intention, something that's been pre-selected to evoke a certain meaning or reading, perhaps. I mean, maybe to illustrate uh, the interest in design, what I have given to this uh, idea we talked about before. There is a work which I uh, did, which was called 30 Colors. So I selected 30 Colors from the Pantona sample, which was published in 2000, when Pantona advertised their new sample with the new colors for the new millennium. Mm -hmm. So, and while I did this work, I was looking at samples by Pantona from the 70s. Right. And the interesting thing is that the color range changed. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm absolutely sure if you look at certain images from the 70s, color prints, and you look today, you can immediately say they are, you date them very quick. You understand like, what you see, where they are coming from, what time period they're coming from. I'm absolutely sure that at the time in the 70s, people were looking at these images. They would not have seen them as we see them today as something which is not matching reality, which is somehow representing reality in a certain form. So the form, what you perceive, the sense to stay in, in there is everything. So the design, the, the making decisions to design something is moving in this kind of uh, field that you make things possible and understandable when you want to reflect later, but as well, you make decisions exactly about this way, how things are talking to you, how you talk with things, how your communication is designed, but really in a way that the form on the basis of how our senses are working are there. Like when Schoenberg introduced the 12 tone technique, absolutely sure people heard it very different than we do it today. Mm -hmm. So, there's also a history of the senses. And in design, you have that. In typography as well. I mean, you can see now how typography changed a lot in the last five to six years, where uh, when you compare it to a typography of the late 70s, you, you can immediately say where, when it was warm. And you can also analyze why it is like that. So, and uh, I think in the design or the process of uh, designing things, you do exactly these things what uh, people later try to understand what you did. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that makes me think of uh, some thinking writing I've done around historical conceptual art where the, the typeface is, is treated as if invisible, as if ahistorical in you know, a lot of those classic uh, works. Um, when of course it has it has a very embedded history, you know, very linked to kind of the evolution of technocratic society, how typewriters come to be, how monospace fonts exist, and you know, I think that's very nice that you've your example even took that to the level of chroma, like the most basic palette for building building a design or building a, uh, a, a concrete poem, perhaps. You know, even that should be thought historically in your in your rendering. I think that's very nice. Um, I want to bring in. Um, the last question we have in, in the chat uh, from uh, Astra asking, um, thanks very much for the talk. May I ask whether the large scale outdoor sculptures that you've produced posed any challenges as opposed to making smaller scale works? Okay, so I guess a kind of question of scale and um, the, I guess the, the, the discrete problematics of scale, you know, whether the mediation between those two is uh, something. That, um, you could comment on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to thank you for this question because uh, on the one side, when you see this monument, you see these big uh, sculptural pieces, 
but uh, there is a large part of my work where I'm very interested in very tiny little gestures, in very tiny little things, like the Leporello what I have shown. There's nothing else than this Leporello what is there. So, and uh, also giveaways, like stickers or little uh, things, which are just uh, presents which you can, there. Yeah. Also, that you ask people to be somewhere. Uh, there was one piece what I want to give as an example, a piece about gardening, or the garden as a concept. And what I ask is if somebody could arrange that all the time when this garden is open to the public, uh, identical twins are present in the garden. Nothing else. So there was no appointment, there was nothing, there were just identical twins walking through the garden. So if you would go there, maybe you'd pay attention to it or not. And it was a, so these like little gestures are like, I like really the concept of the gesture very much, that you can just, uh, that is the most difficult thing to come to such articulations, which are working on such a minor level, but if you understand, if you get them, everything is changing. Yeah. So, yeah, again, the sort of um, the, ge the gesture that sort of twists or torsions the work, perhaps, in some way. I mean, that um, brings me back to it. In a way, I was, I was very struck and, uh, by, if I re understood you correctly, so I'll play it back, but in your reading of Ulipo, um, you characterize, and through Roussel, perhaps particularly, or or the influence of Roussel into Ulipo. You talked about um, the way in which that group uh, functioned to turn tensions into intensities. I think that was how you, how you put it. Was that right? Tensions into in intensities. Tensions into intensity, yeah. So uh, the way how they articulated themselves. So I, I just um, wondered if this notion of framing what Ulipo is doing is the notion of turning attention into an intensity informed, yeah. informed your work yeah. rather than perhaps a, a more narrow reading of, you know, playing with constraint, you know, which I think is sometimes the, one of the ways in which a, an Ulipan practice is, is kind of mediated. Yeah. No, no, that, that is for sure. I mean, the, the way how they frame things by that what they're doing or how they this, this way coming from the intention to the intensity of how they call it this is something what in forming the thing you know what sets the things in form and what it makes it possible and uh that is something what is very influential for me but then maybe also get, going back to the question before which maybe connects the two questions how you can uh reframe a thing but you don't know exactly what happens I just distributed a postcard in Naples, which was a found object where one of the main squares, which today is a pedestrian area, was a parking lot. Um, I printed on the backside of the postcard, free parking coming soon. And I distributed it over Naples. And two months later, a friend of mine told me, uh, maybe you should look up the news. And the same image what was on the postcard was recreated by the taxi drivers on this spot on, on Piazza because of an action they wanted to go and strike. So I don't know if they were really influenced by this postcard. I mean, the city council made a statement that a German artist wants to transform this pedestrian into a parking lot or whatever. But just this postcard, which I found and found interesting, redistributed, maybe created this. I don't know. I really have no idea. But somehow, obviously, there could be a link. I, I cannot prove it, but there is something what happens with the frame and the reframing. And this kind of way of acting and this way of uh, trying to make things happening is something what I found extremely interesting for me. And I all the time expecting that these things are happening and I don't pay attention to them and I don't notice them, but they are happening maybe all the time. Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic uh, uh, story, perhaps, to begin to uh, draw our uh, conversation uh, to a close, perhaps, or to bring some closing thoughts into play where these, this kind of small gesture seeds something which maybe turns into a political act at the, at the sort of level of the, of the kind of polis, you know. Uh, uh, but 
question mark again, always with this notion of a certain kind of open endedness or a, uh, the question, I guess, of determination you, you want to forestall perhaps uh, in ways I find quite interesting, perhaps with relation to uh, a, a kind of politics as well. I mean, maybe, you know, thinking about the way your monument registers in quite a sophistic, sophisticated way, uh, a kind of a, a, an open endedness or a multiplicity of address, um, which you know, perhaps even uh, from your from your story you just discussed is could be linked to the to, to an indeterminate moment that emerges from the conditions you've established. And again, perhaps then speaks to this sort of broad history of language, poetry, and poesis uh, in ways that maybe we could you know draw some threads together in. In conclusion, and I'll just scan to see if any more questions are, are coming in. But I think probably um, that might be a nice moment in your response to to conclude. Yeah, I mean, uh, Charles Bernstein at the end of his talk was playing a bit of Mahler music. So, and um, the music as a concept is something what uh, when you connect that with, with language. He had the poems of Rickert and uh, the, the Mahler. Uh, there is a nice, uh, or I think what really uh, touches me a lot when I uh, listen to music and to come to this point, which I want to connect with. Uh, Jean-Luc Nancy was once saying, most people would describe music if they need to compare it to language, like, oh, music is like language without sense. And if you take the sense away, you're just the sound or whatever. And then, but he proposed an opposite uh, 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 statement. Maybe music is, sense minus language so and there we are you know when we deal in this field uh how does it work i mean where are we because language is something what obviously is extremely needed but on the other way uh what he is calling the sense is something what never is fully represented there and there's never really something what can be crap in total by it so and for him, music is given, the tone, something given that. And that is also connecting to the question which uh, Nick had with the question of design, you know, the composition of music, the, the way how a tone is modulated, how a sound is touching you or not. And these kind of things, uh, there you are. I mean, this is what uh, really is the point, what I found when I heard poetry, or when I talk about poetry, which I uh, feel very strongly associated with. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Olaf, for your conversation. Thanks to our audience for uh, their questions. And I think we've got Claire. I'm not quite sure how we're concluding. So Claire is going to uh, <laughs> bring things to a uh, briefly, Luke, rich, moving briefly. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Olaf and to you, Luke, for just a wonderful, wonderful lecture. But for today, thank you so much to all of our speakers, to Olaf for his brilliant keynote. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's a great thing to, that you made that possible that poetry is here.